Gentlemen, the Bay Foreman Chipman. Thank you very much. Commence the uh, evening's proceedings by inviting the GM to recite the council prayer. Thank you, Mayor. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this council. Direct and prosperous deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of the City of Clarence. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'd like to remind uh, everyone that the meeting is being recorded audio-visually and that uh, it will be available on the Council website later this week. And before proceeding, I'd like to acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal community as the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on tonight and pay our respects to Elders past and present. Thank you. There's a meeting open. Note that there are no apologies. Item 2, confirmation of minutes for 13th of January and the special council meeting on the 22nd of, 22nd of January as circulated be taken as read and confirmed. Thank you, Alderman Pearce. Seconder, please. Thank you, Alderman Chong. There being no comment, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, the Mayor's communication, I'd like to table my uh, significant calendar appointments over the last period, please. Be available in the minutes. Uh, I've got nothing to, in particular to talk about this meeting other than to table them. Um, item 4. Council notes the workshops conducted on the 20th and 28th of January and the agenda brief on the 31st of January. If mover, thank you. Alderman Edmund, second Alderman Ewington, all those in favour? Carried unanimously. Item five, are there any declarations of interest of Alderman or close associate? Thank you. Item six, uh, tabling of petitions. There's nothing in the agenda. Any petitions from the floor? Thank you. Public question time. Um, 7.1 and 7.2 uh, questions on notice and indeed answers to previous questions taken on notice. General Manager, would you like to walk us through those? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, we have a uh, question on notice from uh, Mr Griggs of Risdon Vale. Uh, Mr Griggs' question was, will Council reduce its own water consumption in its operations can a review be done as to how this can happen? Also, can this be publicly announced? The answer to the question is, Clarence Council uses water to manage ovals, parks, and providing facilities such as public toilets and halls for the community and to undertake civil construction. The water used is the minimum required to maintain our level of service to the community. As with other utilities, we manage our water use continually and comply with TAS water restrictions, unless an exemption has been uh, deemed necessary and approved by TAS water. The second question, or there are two questions from Mr Chick uh, of Mornington. I'll provide the uh, question in each answer um, as we go. Um, the first question was related to alternative venues for council meetings. The question was, has Council considered alternative locations to hold meetings where attendance is expected to overflow, and if not, why? The answer to that question is, in accordance with the local government meeting procedures regulations, meeting times and locations are advertised in advance once per year. The introduction of an alternative location where a large attendance is expected has the potential to cause significant confusion. Council has, within the limitations of the current building, sought to accommodate large meetings on the basis that the infrastructure used for each meeting is not required to be duplicated elsewhere. Any future change of location will be a matter for Council to consider. The second question was regarding new Council premises. The question was, I am aware that Council has been considering constructing and moving to new chambers for some time as it is painfully obvious the existing chambers are inadequate. 
is there any meaningful time frame Council can offer as to when this can feasibly occur? The answer to the question is as follows. This Council, as a part of its strategic plan review, has identified the need for new chambers as a priority. The initial process to realise a new Council Chambers building will focus on location, features and requirements for a new facility and involve community consultation. It is expected that a new council building could take three to five years to realise. Thank you. Uh, Mr Mayor, a question in relation to that. Uh, has council made a decision, the full council, in relation to new council chambers or a location thereof? Yes, that is no. No decision has yet been made. Thank you. Um, and uh, 7.3 answers to previous question taken on notice. Uh, I think the oh, answer. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, 7.3, the uh, answers to previous questions taken on notice. There was a question from uh, Mrs Marsh of Bell Reeve, uh, and the answer is provided uh, within the agenda, and I propose that we take that as read. Thank you. Uh, question four. Oh, item 7.4, questions without notice. Are there any questions without notice from members of the public? Yes. Uh, if you could come forward to the microphone and uh, tell us your name and address, please, before asking the question. Thomas Chick, Mornington. Prior to the special council meeting, those of us in the overflow room were informed by the general manager that he was only aware of the issues with that room, audio and visual, 15 minutes before the meeting was due to begin. I was disappointed to hear the general manager say that it had been working the last time it was needed. Why were the systems not tested in advance of the meeting, specifically on the day of? Thank you for the question. Um, the, um, the answer to that is uh, that the system had been working the last time we used it. Uh, in the intervening period, there was some um, work done to the, uh, the system uh, within this chamber, and unbeknownst to, uh, to myself and staff, um, a, the speakers in the overflow room had been disconnected to do that. Uh, we hadn't tested that, we'd assumed that they were working and since that time we have implemented a, uh, a checking system that involves uh, staff checking on the Friday afternoon that the system in full is working, uh, signing off that and providing it to me uh, before the close of business on Friday. That system is designed to allow us, uh, should we find a problem, a full working day in which to organise uh, um, any, any work that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mrs. March. My name is Joanne Marsh, and I live at 32 A King Street, Bell Reeve. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for Council's prompt attention in removing the dead trees assessed as being a, a potential risk to the community that I expressed concern ab about recently. Um, this is my question. Um, in my feedback about the draft community engagement policy in late November 2019, I suggested that a group of community members be included in the under review step in the, in the review process. I also volunteered to be involved. I have been a classroom teacher in the city of Clarence for 40 years. The most important part of my work was engaging with students, parents and colleagues to build a strong, purposeful learning community. My question is, does the current review process for the draft community engagement policy allow for a group of community members to participate? If not, how can this be urgently rectified to allow for this important change to be implemented for the current policy review? Um, I'm 
looking to uh, Mr Sadler and he'll correct me if I've got any of the detail wrong. My uh, recollection um, is that the current draft policy doesn't include a community engagement um, group as a standing you know, uh, arrangement um, and that there's flexibility built into the policy in terms of the sorts of uh, consultations we can undertake depending on the circumstances uh, that we, uh, we might be dealing with at the time. So there isn't a proposal to have uh, a selected group of people um, involved with the community pro um, consultation process at this point. I, I don't think that's the answer I wanted to hear. That's very disappointing. Sorry, that's, yeah. that's the answer I can offer. Any other questions without notice from members of the public? Thank you. Uh, General Manager, deputations by members of the public. Uh, thank you, Mayor. We have uh, one deputation tonight, Mr Marcel Castile of Cleve Court. As you come forward, I need to remind all speakers, in fact, that uh, there's only a three minute window and there'll be a tone at two and a half minutes. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone, uh, Mr Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor and all the Aldermen for the opportunity um, to do this deputation. On behalf of the Cleve Court and Corinth Street residents who are in attendance today in regards to the petition we lodged last year for the objection for the extension to the track uh, at the Cleve Court foreshore. Um, the deputation, as you remember last year, um, we deemed the uh, report to be incomplete because not only it didn't address all the uh, concerns that we raised in the petition, but also it didn't really give us a balanced view or had any evidence of any of the statements that were within that report. As we now have the final report, uh, we still have very much concerns because it's still not a balanced view and the statements that are made do not have any evidence to support them, that they, our concerns um, you know, can be uh, mitigated or have been assessed properly. So um, I suppose everyone knows the concerns. I did send an email to uh, everyone in, on the 17th of November. It had some of the issues, evidence of uh, drainage issues with the tracks, evidence from other people, um, pictures of the street, of the parking, which was, was a concern. Um, I would have expected maybe the report to have some assessment, maybe traffic engineering, uh, what the issue, if there are issues if people will, are using, track and par using the street as parking, which it's not really intended for. It does say in the report that if there is an issue, it will only be for a few days. That's pretty uh, not really um, correct for us because we are saying emergency vehicles might not be able to respond in due time because it is a very narrow street. I think signage isn't uh, really the proper because we, there is an issue and there is no proper engineering to mitigate those concerns. Um, just the other thing is, um, it says that we've been consul and that consultation has been carried out uh, since the 17th of November. We haven't really been um, contacted by the council or their representatives, like the officers that pre made this report, to show our concerns. It does say here there's no vegetation removal. Uh, when you look at the map, uh, there definitely is no vegetation removal in front of the uh, Cleave Court number 14 and 16. Uh, the other issue is um, the uh, drainage. We, we've got serious concerns about drainage because it is an issue on the other track, as I've shown in the photos, but there's no calculations or proper um, engineering drainage design. It does say we've got a design, but it's got no appendices or anything. So we still deem this uh, report to not be addressing our concerns and to be inadequate. That's our view. Thank you. Thanks very much. No, thank you. No other deputations. Uh, there are no notices on notice. Reports from outside bodies, uh, item 10.1 is a copying refuge disposal site joint authority. I notice that September and December 14th reports are pending. Do you wish to I, add to well, that? Yeah, look, I, I will, I'm surprised they're, they're not here yet. I'll be chasing it up at the meeting between the next council meeting. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Walker. Tasmania Water Corporation, I'd like to uh, table a quarterly report to owners representatives for December. And. Um, Alderman James, you've yes. got a question? Yes, look, uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, 
as uh, you are our representative on TAS Water, and given that there is uh, some concern in the community regarding conservation of water and better uses of water, is it possible <coughs> for yourself to go, obviously, to the next meeting and discuss ways in which um, TAS Water, with its reticulated water system that provides the community, and, and council stormwater uh, system, its responsibility for it. Is there any way in which TAS Water can provide a better public relations in, in, through their uh, system organisation to conserve water and also to, to look at better ways in which the community can utilise and save water in the interest of the community? I know it's a long-winded a, a question, but I think there is a role for council as part of its stormwater system and conservation <coughs> and reticulation of from Taz Water to be able to come together and have a joint uh, policy in relation to it. I'd appreciate that could be considered. Well, um, there's a couple of things there. Firstly, um, Taz Water up until now has not publicly advocated for roof rainwater capture. Um, because it's often uneconomical for uh, people to go down that path because the variable cost of water in Tasmania is only about 20% of the bill and so the cost of capital is an inhibition against the actual cost of water itself. Um, in regard to the stormwater, um, apart from the combined system in Launceston, Tas Water doesn't have any responsibility legally for stormwater. However, under the shareholders' uh, letter of expectation, it is expected that TAS Water would persist, participate in any development or review by a council of management plans for the use of storm water. So um, while I'm happy to raise it, to get any sort of momentum here, it would require a motion from council to go forward to TAS Water with some sort of initiative in that regard. Uh, I will add that TAS Water does run an extensive education program in terms of conservation of water. Um, it uh, also involves the schools in that education program and it uses all media forms uh, such as print TV and radio channels as it, direct, as it engages with that community education program on the importance of conservation of water. So, but nevertheless, I, I will raise that at the next meeting. Thanks, Alderman Jones. Any other questions on the TAS water report? Thank you. And the Greater Hobart uh, Committee, there's nothing to report on that at this stage. We have a meeting coming up in the near future and I'll report the next council meeting on that one. 10.2, uh, reports from council and special committees and other representative bodies. Are there any reports from committees and representative bodies? Okay, there being none, we'll move on to reports of officers. 11.1, that the information in the weekly briefing reports of the 13th, 20th and 27th of January be noted. If I could have a move, thank you. Alderman Blomley, second to Alderman Kennedy. Uh, are there any questions on the weekly briefing reports? In that case, put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Uh, there are no petitions to deal with, so I advise that Council now intends to sit as a planning authority under the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act. Item 11.3.1 is a development application for 80 Bertonia Street, Rokeby, for a 48 lot subdivision. Uh, moved Alderman Walker, seconded Alderman Newington, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Alderman Walker, would you like to speak to the motion? Look, I'll be brief. It's a, um, it's a if you like, a subsequent 40-lot um, subdivision from the uh, rezoning that occurred in that area. Uh, it's a rational place for a subdivision to occur, and I can't stress enough that as people will concentrate on the housing um, issue that's facing the state, that actually land supply is a big component. Uh, the pushback you get around rezoning is there's X number of lots that are zoned and ready to go, but those lots tend to be held and tend to be drip fed onto the market. This is going to be used pretty much from the get-go. It's a 
positive uh, for, for the, the community and I uh, seek the support of other Oldham. Um, yeah, wholeheartedly agree with uh, Oldham Walker on that one. Um, and increasing supply and, and uh, in the market is certainly an important part of that. Um, the other side, I think, that it, it puts the pressure on us now to come up with a, a way to make sure that those houses, because we are losing some public open space in that area, to really look at what we do down in that space in, in terms of rugby to really enhance the, uh, the recreational and, and the social engagement opportunities for that community as well. I think just to put the houses in there and not really make us look at that next stage because we want houses that, that are not only affordable but they're actually healthy to live in um, and a community that's more engaged and more able to, uh, to enjoy you know, living as a community. And I think that's a big part of what we need to be looking at certainly moving forward. And hopefully if this uh, proposal goes ahead, and the sooner the better. Thank you. Mine's uh, just more of a, a question. I think is that um, I note that there are um, that there is a, a lot of, that's currently being assessed for the purposes of multiple dwellings. Um, when we put the whole site into context, just how what is the potential dwelling yield? Be able to assist us there, Mr. Lovell. Eighty units, two people per. Uh, <coughs> Through Mr. Mayor, I can't answer that off the spot without counting them up and, and doing some calculations. But what I can say in relation to the lot that's, that has uh, referred to as a multiple unit site, and that's because in order to have a larger lot, you need to have dedicated for that purpose. So that's the only ones, that, or only, only those lots that say multiple dwellings are dedicated um, with, as larger lot sizes. Um, it's mo can I say most likely, just having a quick look, that most of the lots are, are, are close to the <coughs> But uh, I need time to check each one. Um, it, it's just that you've got <coughs> two, eight hectares, you've got 48 lot subdivision, plus a uh, 2.296 uh, square metres for the purpose of multiple, multiple dwellings and a separate permitted development application for multiple dwellings on the site is currently being assessed. So, I mean, if we're currently assessing it, um, can't be offhand how many dwellings are proposed in that assessment? Yeah, it's just that it's not the same dwellings that are proposed in that assessment. I do have to ask the relevance of this to a subdivision application as opposed to a building application. <laughs> you are currently doing a subdivision for multiple dwellings. The relevance of it is, is that when we look at the, the potential for the units, I would just like to know what the potential density is in that particular area because it seems to me that, um, that uh, you know, 48 lots plus the other one, the purpose of that is I'd like to know that, um, you know, we're not, um, um, shall we say, overcrowding an area of social housing because of all the issues that, uh, that we have been through many, many times when we get clusters of units, and particularly in Rokeby in that area there, there are some really high density dwellings, uh, areas, which uh, attend to some social matters. So that's my issue. I'm not necessarily, I'm not going to vote against it. I don't think it's appropriate to do so, but I think we ought to be, made, we ought to be informed, we ought to have the knowledge of what density of dwellings are going to go into what was formerly public open space. How to provide any relief? Not at this stage. We'll have to provide that after the meeting uh, next week. Yep. Any other speakers? Right of reply? Uh, I'll just make out that when uh, subdivisions are coming before us, uh, a mix of, of properties is, is a, a pretty good thing. Um, the the makeup of, of, of the family unit and, and the number of people per dwellings have been changing over time and a three to four bedroom house on a block isn't the, the solution for everyone. So uh, I note what uh, Alderman Mulder said, Your Worship, but uh, I would say what I said, what Alderman Ewington said and uh, seek your support. So the recommendation is for approval subject to conditions and advice. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. 11.3.2 is a development application at 1 Monique Street, Harrow for a one lot subdivision.
moved to Alderman Newington. Second that. Going once. Thank you, Alderman Mulder. Thank you. Um, Alderman Newington, do you wish to speak to? Oh, I've just uh, I've said on a few other occasions in similar situations like this, if they've jumped through all the hurdles and, and been able to comply with the planning scheme, and it seems like it's a, uh, a reasonably good compromise in relation to the, to the land that's available up there, and I encourage my fellow fellow aldermen to support this. I mean, every you know subdivisions are great, but also you know one block here and two blocks there and subdividing and creating more opportunities for people to build houses um, is what we're here to, to achieve, and uh, I'd uh, certainly support this one. Thank you, Alderman Mulder. Other speakers? Okay, so there's no need for a right of reply. I put the motion for approval subject to conditions and advice. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Moving on to 11.3.3, I think the general manager. Um, we've received an application to withdraw um, this, this item. It will require a procedural motion. So I need a procedural motion. Uh, moved Alderman Blomley, seconded Alderman Piers, that this motion be withdrawn or deferred? Withdrawn. 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 Uh, all those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. And Alderman Blomley, do you wish to declare an interest? I see myself, Mr Mayor, from item 11.3.4. My apologies, I didn't jump at uh, part five. Uh, agenda. Seven point three point four is an amendment application for modification of the Cambridge Industrial Estate specific area plan. I'll oh, move that. Thank you, Alderman James. Do we have a seconder, please? Alderman Kennedy. Alderman James, would you like to speak to it? Yes. Look, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, this matter is really um, making sure that when uh, the Department of State Growth uh, obviously builds the bypass. Cambridge and Richmond Road, that there is a sufficient uh, width in that uh, section of road which will become the property of uh, the Department of State Growth, that there does um, have a, a, a reasonable setback which has always basically been for that area and in particular for one of the precincts that's been uh, identified in part two of the recommendation. So in other words, uh, there has been a provision within the Cambridge industrial area of a, of a 10 metre setback. Um, this in the first instance does mean that other than the frontage to Precinct C, buildings must have a setback from the frontage of, and that has basically been of 10 metres. And also uh, under part three, to modify the corresponding performance criteria to include an additional consideration that any of the written advice from the Department, Department of State Growth or its successor is actually considered as part of any change to which the particular roadworks in that area would be um, considered. So I seek council support, it tidies up this issue and I think it does provide sufficient um, uh, support uh, and amendment to a couple of these areas which were a sort of uh, insufficient detail, if that's the terminology, and I would seek council support. Thank you. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Other speakers? Okay, so uh, no need for right reply. I'll put the recommendation, which is to uh, go ahead and warrant the, uh, the following public consultation. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Could we recall Alderman Blomley, please? And that concludes our business as a planning authority. Next item on the agenda is 11.5.1 under asset management concerning an MOU with Southern Regional Council's waste management and resource recovery. Recommendation is we authorise the GM to sign the MOU. If we can have a mover. Thank you. Alderman Warren. Seconder, Alderman Blomley. Would you like to speak to it? Thank you, Alderman Blomley. Other speakers? Alderman James. I have a question through you to Mr Graham in his capacity as a manager of asset management. Uh, Mr Graham, uh, do you foresee that there will be any member 
or of the southern region that will opt not to be party to the MOU and therefore would consider going it alone or do their own thing uh, rather than join as a, as a group and a body as one. not aware of anyone uh, but that's not to say that there might be a council that decides not to proceed at this point in time as I understand things uh, out of the 12 southern region councils um, I think there are eight or nine who have already signed uh, so there's ourselves and a couple of others that are, remain outstanding um, the um, signing up fee if you want to call it that is 18,000 per annum um, is that a blanket amount that would each of those members would be required to um, pay or is there some sliding scale depending upon their capability to pay? Um, thank you, uh, James. Uh, it's a sliding scale um, and the methodology to determine that scale has yet to be determined. That will be by agreement between the participating councils. Um, but it's expected to be between $13,500 and $18,000 for clearance. Um, so we are recommending that we budget for the maximum amount as a as an outlier. Any other speakers? I'm not supporting this because um, I think this Southern Waste strategy, which we've previously signed up to, I might say, um, is um, and I voted against it then. Um, it's just same old, same old. We are just doing what we've done before. The uh, demise of SKM, who were incapable of disposing particularly of their plastic wastes, they put it into, you know, that was into storage. Then we came along and we gave a letter of comfort to the, uh, to the uh, corporate undertakers <laughs> to say, um, you know, uh, yes, we're happy to sign up to and um, just to keep that business afloat, to, just to keep the system afloat. You know, then we go and we give a letter of comfort. As a result of that, we are paying $120 to deliver this, $120 a tonne to deliver it to the gate of the new people. Right? Now, if we took the, and, and um, what happens there is the glass is delivered free to the, uh, to the gate of a, of, a, uh, of a quarry, so it therefore ends up in the road, which is being recycled, but it has commercial value but because we're paying all this money up front, there's no need for this business model, this, the, the people who are taking it, to then go and, um, and deliver it on, to, to sell it on to the quarries, even though it has commercial value. It's all because we are subsidising this stuff to the gate. Plastics is a problem. I still have yet to find um, a per anyone who's going to say, in southern Tasmania, we can cope with, there's a market, for the amount of material that could be recycled. Then you get the soft plastics which can't be recycled. If you have a look at uh, Coca-Cola recently, and they uh, advised that uh, when they were asked, um, you know, are you recycling, you know, are your plastic bottles being made from recycled material? The answer was, oh yes, but it's sourced from Thailand. So, you know, I mean, up until recently, it was probably our bottles going up there, but being recycled back through Thailand. So you have this model where and we're perpetuating it by front-loading the front end for a company. What they can't get rid of, they, you know, we pay $120 to the ton. If they can't get rid of it and they can't store it, it's going to turn up at Copping, where we charge $60 to take it back. It's a wonder the trucks aren't going out to the, out to the depot, loading up and uh, not even sorting it, but just turning it around and selling it and, and taking it back out to Copping. What you've got is a need 100% profit because we charge, you, you know, we, took, we, we gave them $120 to take it to their gate, but we only give them $60 when they deliver it to ours. It just seems to me that here was an opportunity to go and do some serious stuff about um, looking at this plastics problem, about looking at the supply chain, but that's the debate for another day. So here we go again. We've just been sucked into business as usual when we know that business as usual was a failure under the old regime, and here we are massive gate fees, increasing gate fees, <coughs> delivered to the new company. You know, so I, I just don't see how this, the, how this is going to work when there's so many good ideas for what we could be doing with it. Okay. 
Look, a um, couple of points. The, the previous speaker talked a lot about in the recycling space. Now, Victoria, the Bolsheviks, um, did actually sign on to container deposit scheme as a concept uh, last week, I think. So that is now basically going to be in all Australian jurisdictions, and that's the one that matters to us because that's nearby. You can imagine the joy of uh, anyone that saw that great Seinfeld episode where you load your car with all the stuff from Victoria and bring it down here if, if we put our scheme and they didn't have it. So that's coming in and that is basically front end loading a uh, high amount of recycling waste. So I, I just make that point. I also make the point that this isn't specifically about the issues of recycling. It is about waste in general. Um, and I do support the principle of this MOU. I do support the principle we should be working collectively um, in this space, which does give me time to make my churlish remarks about the $2,000 that we could have just um, blown on pizza rather than give to STCA. What a um, what a disappointing entity! What a complete waste of space uh, in as far as what we what we what we got for that money because that was meant to be in this waste area. They were meant to be taking it on board. What a, what an abysmal moribund organisation. Um, this needs to be better, and I'm confident with Elga running it that it will be better. So. You should have confidence around that. You should have confidence around the fact that with the North West working collaboratively and the North working collaboratively, the South needs to as well. So these things are real positives. And here's my dilemma. Um, I don't know that I have enough comfort to support what we have in front of us now. Because, you know, point four, 4.5 of the memorandum is working towards greater commonality of service standards for ratepayers and customers. Now that is homogeneity. That is not a good thing. It is actually, uh, if you believe in the laboratories of democracy's principle, if you believe in delivering uh, services and ratings that best meet your community needs, then this is a ticket towards the one size fits all, be it the fortnightly, you know, advocating for fortnightly pickups or, or not. I mean, I, I stood in 2011 on, on green waste wheelie bins and, and we were the first council to introduce them. There's actually initi initiatives happening in different spaces and being able to service these your communities and wanting to do things a bit differently in that space is important while still looking at lots of macro issues, if you like, in a collective voice. So some comfort around that would be helpful to me. Um, the other bit I don't like about that, <laughs> you know, commonality of service standards for ratepayers and customers, uh, it sounds a little bit cartel -y when you talk about that with customers. Um, I don't think that's the intention, but then again, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, 4.6 uh, is, is generally pretty reasonable, um, but 4.1, um, you know, where it talks about managing regional waste streams in a coordinated professional manner, including but not limited to landfill recycling, green waste, FOGO. Um, I have some discomfort around this because uh, the council's all starting from different places. Actually, we are, I, I think from the research I've done, we, we, we are the most responsible with waste. The awful truth is putting the garden scraps into the Clarence waste bin, getting taken down to copping, being covered with land, with being, being covered over the top and then having methane extracted is actually a better environmental outcome than putting stuff in an old truck, driving it up to the central highlands and expecting it in tropical interlaken to just decompose. And, and I wouldn't want a scheme where we're all going up and do it. So the MOU has wriggle room and you can probably get out and, and so there's some comfort around that, I guess. Um, if this motion doesn't get up, um, then I think were it to come before us in three weeks' time, it probably could in a very solid fashion. It would just be uh, spelling out with some undertakings uh, around some of the points that no, you know, we're not locked into agreeing to this or, or, or agreeing to that. Um, because the concept of working together is great, but when, when different councils are coming from such different areas, it may well be in the interest of a lot of councils to be looking towards, uh, you know, working to that, that lower level or, or making us all have FOGO bins or what scares me the most is, you know, the inceptions along the way of a TAS water of waste, uh, in which case the ratepayers in Clarence that uh, are lucky because of the foresight, and I know that Alderman James and Alderman Piers were on this council when it closed the Lauderdale tip and, and, and put the hard yards through to the municipal race, waste station. Uh, I just don't... Those cross-subsidy concerns... Um, 
play on my head. Now, technically, you can read the MOU and there's lots of wriggle room, so you can have some comfort around that, but these are the things that are weighing up in my head about whether to support or not support the MOU without some more concrete feedback around um, whether it's, you know, whether we can actually Thank keep doing it our way. Thank you, Alderman Walker. Other speakers? Broad reply, Alderman Warren. Yeah, um, I guess uh, when you have 12 different councils doing things 12 different ways, um, it makes sense, especially when some of those 12 councils are quite small, it does make sense to work together. And um, I note that, for instance, that Hobart and um, Glenorchy have already implemented FOGO, so we have the advantage of being able to learn from their experience and um, look at implementing a system. And not a week goes past without somebody contacting me and asking when Clarence is going to start such a scheme, as well as general um, recycling of... Uh, more things like tank, paint tins and batteries and some of the schemes that you see available in Hobart and Launceston that we have yet to implement in Clarence. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from working with the other councils and I guess my question is why wouldn't you work with the other councils as economies of scale for doing those things. I mean we're not big in Tasmania, it's not a huge place. It's um, foolish for us to be trying to do it alone and duplicating services across those 12 councils. Um, Alderman Walker mentioned the uh, um, container deposit in, in Victoria. I noticed that today as well, that that's been implemented. And I think all states and territories now um, are planning to implement. Um, Tasmania is um, planned for 2022, I believe. Um, so that's certainly part of the equation. But I noticed that the focus here is on promoting the development of a circular economy for waste streams. So um, those are things that we can do better together than alone and I would urge you to support this. Um, any collective like this is only as good as the people involved. Um, if that wasn't successful last time, let's make sure we have the right people involved this time because there is a lot of innovation and a lot of people with a lot of really good ideas out there which we should be harnessing. So I look forward to moving forward with this. The people want it. Um, we should get on and do it. Thank you. So the motion before the Chair is to authorise the GM to sign the MOU on behalf of Clarence and also allocates some funds for the implementation of the MOU. All those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. 11.5.2 is a petition uh, in regard to Cleve Court foreshore track. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I wish to put the officer's recommendation. Do we have a seconder, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, as we have all seen with the officer's report, both the report and an attachment uh, give a clear overview of each of the particular issues that have been brought up by the petitioners. What I'd like to do is just give a little bit of contextual information so if you like to embed this particular uh, action into the Tranmere Coastal Reserve Activity Plan 2018-22. That plan was actually approved by Council on the 19th of March 2018. And the aldermen who were actually present unanimously approved that particular plan. And a number of the aldermen who are here tonight actually were part of approving that plan. I think it's important to note that as with all of the reserve activity plans, there's a particular process that's undertaken in getting to the stage of approving a plan. In this particular case, Enviro Dynamics was engaged to develop the plan, which involved initial consultation with local community members and some key stakeholder groups with an on-site walk and talk, which is always undertaken with this particular process. And that event was held on the 3rd of September 2017. And it provided input into the development of the draft plan. Interestingly, there were several key issues that came out of that walk and talk. 
And the first two were enhanced recreational opportunities, including walking, cycling, as well as access to the foreshore for swimming and boating. And the other one, which is very pertinent to this particular issue tonight, was formalise walking, biking tracks into Cleve Court and from Pindos Park south to Starboard Road as a gravel track. Importantly, once there was a draft plan, it was actually advertised in De December 2017 and went through to the 22nd of January 2018, so that there was a reasonable opportunity for representations, bearing in mind that there was that Christmas period. I think, interestingly, when it actually came to us and there were some additions and changes and additions, one of them was to install appealing seating with interesting views and some shelters stroke picnic tables on the riverside of the track and to invite sponsorship of seating. I actually see this headland that we're talking about as an ideal place for the track, which is strategically been set down to go through that area. And it's important to note that the Clarence Foreshore Trail has some gaps in it, which we are looking to actually complete those gaps so that we have a continuous foreshore trail. This is one area. So I actually think that this is an ideal place to have some seating, perhaps picnic tables, in relation to being able to view the river and that beautiful view over to the mountain and to the other side of the river, the, the city. And it fits fairly and squarely into the Tranmere Coastal Reserve Activity Plan, which we actually approved in March of 2018. Thank you. Well, Mary, thank you, Mr. Um, obviously, I agree with uh, everything that uh, I said there. I mean, the, the, uh, it's not only the, uh, the Tramere uh, Recreation Activity Plan that, that's supportive of this project, it's the uh, Tracks and Trails Committee and, and the desire of the people in that committee to say that the, uh, the, the coastal trail continue to expand throughout our city. It's part of our strategic plan as a council to, um, to create the recreational and, and um, um, picnic areas and, and you know, there's tracks and trails that are going to help us to, uh, to increase the health and wellbeing of the community. Um, I mean, I look at the uh, you know, map of the significant trails in our city and it quite clearly shows that our goal is to do that. And for us to then turn around all of a sudden and say that uh, no, we're not going to continue the, the tracks and trails, that, that means we're basically saying we're going to throw out our current plan and our, and our priority areas, which are identified quite clearly in um, quite a few documents that, that we've all approved in the past and I certainly support now as, a, as one of the newer aldermen. Um, you know, and, I, and, I, and I seriously do see the coastal trail as the most significant public recreation asset in, in our city. I mean, it links all of our sports grounds, playgrounds and our significant spaces. And for us to allow uh, it to be stopped and, and not to be linked together or to slow progress, I, I, just, uh, I, I just don't think that we're in a position where we should allow that to happen. Um, I, mean, you know, I mean, I know people have a right to object and fear of change and all those sort of things is a legitimate thing. And I, and I, and I do feel for the people that are, that are a bit concerned, but I mean, the reality of it is that some of the objections that are there, I, you know, I think the officers have done a fantastic job of actually breaking them apart and, and pointing out that you know, that most of, you know, all those things can, can be quite accurately dealt with. I mean, you know, if we stop ever doing anything because someone might put a, you know, take a trail bike in there or, or, or these sort of things, I mean, yeah, I'd love to stop people doing the wrong thing with trail bikes and a lot of other antisocial behaviour, but just because it might happen doesn't mean it, it you know, it, it, it will. I mean, you know, I like the, the aspect there where, you know, increased security, you know, more people in there means it's, it's safer, not necessarily a, a secluded area that some people are claiming. Um, I mean, the, the real one that sort of hit it for me in, in part of the report here, which, which really sort of stood out, I mean, at the moment, um, you know, the, the, the track will devalue the, the properties. I mean, I just, 
I certainly don't think it will. I mean, you know, at, at the moment we've got a situation where, you know, there's been picnic tables, brick barbecues, seating and landscape garden beds on public land, which gives the impression to the public that they are trespassing through private backyards. All right, a foreshore track invites the public to use this space, which will lessen the sense of exclusivity that currently exists. And I'll tell the story of myself and my partner. I took her down there for a walk. Um, would have been probably at least 12 months ago now before we got to this point where we're going to uh, considering this extension of the track. I said, hey, let's go up there and I'll show you up on that path. Because I mean, I used to have a couple of good mates that lived up in Cleve Court. And I want to show her up in that area. And she said, no, it's all pri it's private land. I said, no, it's not. It's public land. And she said, no, I'm not going up there. It looks like it's all there, you know, the, the picnic table's there. And I said, no, it's not. And she wouldn't even go up there with me. And I knew it was pri uh, public land. So if that's one example of it happening, how many other people are being excluded from this space, you know, because they think that it is, um, you know, someone else's space? And I mean, I mean, I could go through all the other objections that are there. And I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I certainly think that they, they can be dealt with. I mean, there's been plenty of consultation. The track doesn't go to nowhere, it links up with the existing coastal trail from Tranmere. I mean, you know, that's a clear part. And our goal is to go all the way around. Um, I don't think it will adversely affect any, uh, any owner's property uh, values. I don't think it will affect their amenity. And I mean, look, the bottom line is, I mean, it comes down to one simple question. I mean, whose land is it? You know, now while we've got 30 people out there that are objecting to it, we've got 54,970 people that I think we have an obligation to, to follow through with the plans that we've put forward to them in previous situations. You know, we've told them we're going to continue with a, with, a, with a coastal trail. It's quite clear to all of us that that's the most, one of the most pop, is the most popular um, recreational thing in our, in our city. And I think it's one of the things that we can you know, hang our hats on and say that we, we've been, we've shown the leadership and, 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 the, um, and the foresight to actually you know, go ahead. It's a legacy project that's not just about one little link of a trail. It's something that we should be aiming um, you know, to really you know, continue to develop and make it even better than what it currently is. And that's certainly one thing that I'd love to see. And I mean, the real issue here though too is, I mean, it's, it's public land, it should be available to the public. And it sets a terrible precedent for us from a governance perspective in relation to changing this as a whim away from a couple of policies, you know, quite significant, you know, council adopted policies. And the other thing is, it makes it really hard if we want to continue other sections in the future. And I just don't think we can, um, you know, we should be doing that um, in this situation, I think it's a fantastic thing that's going to add to the trial, and I, you know, encourage the rest of my Alderman to support this important project. Thank you, Alderman Ewing, and other speakers. Alderman Edmonds. Um, I think I've circulated the alternative motion to everybody here this afternoon um, that if this doesn't get support, I'll move. And the words to that are that the project be suspended for future budgets pending capacity to link with other foreshore pathways or other camp council infrastructure. Um, I think the key word there is this, the word suspended. Um, we're not throwing it in the bin, we're just um, uh, putting it off um, until it stacks up. I actually think, I don't actually disagree with a lot of the points made by Alderman Von Berto and Alderman Newington, to be honest. Um, and I actually think the officer's report is really good work too. Um, I don't believe it creates a precedent because we're not binning it, we're just suspending it. Um, like I said, you can see both sides of the debate, but we do have a petition of the whole street. And I think, I know there's been talk about the reserve activity plan and other sort of things agreed to, granted by previous councils, but that's what we're here to do. But this is sort of part of democracy, isn't it? Like this is a check and balance, because it's very easy to tick off on broad sort of strategies and things like that. But then when you actually start getting your hands dirty, there's going to be times where this sort of thing's going to come up. So. I, some people don't agree with even moving this motion, I understand that, but I think it's part of democracy, isn't it? Um, I had pretty low expectations of getting much support for an alternative motion, um, but you know, if it does actually end up getting up, I think that shows that there is um, a mood of more people than just myself and perhaps Alderman James to do this. Um, you know, either way, I think you know, small sort of signage like what I've circulated previously at um, Gilston Bay would be a really good step, whether it's um, there's a track there or not. And I actually think comments by um, Alderman Von Berto about seating, etc. I mean, that fits with the tone of my alternative motion. I mean, if there's something there, I think it may build a much better case. But I mean, the, what was presented to us was a track, not, not um, other infrastructure. Um, I agree with the tone also about gaps and having a continuous trail. 
but we put this, this uh, track in, we've still got a huge gap anyway. So I appreciate the sort of respectful tone of this debate so far, and I think I've put my case forward. The issue in the attachment two that sticks with me is, is the one about the track being a, a track going nowhere. I think until we can sort of address that question, I'm pretty comfortable with the position that I've just outlined. Gordon James. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I would just like to draw Council's attention to the petition that was lodged with Council on the 11th of November and that was in part to not proceed with the construction of the proposed track as the affected property owners have not been consulted to date in accordance with the community consultation policy. Now that is a large number when we are dealing with Clive Court. We're not dealing with the Tranmere Coastal Reserve activity plan here. It is part of it, it is part of it, but nevertheless, that was actually approved by Council back on the 9th of the 3rd, 2018. A lot of water has passed under the bridge since then, and we have a new Council, and we have a, perhaps an approach to community participation or consultation that may in fact uh, throw new light on whether or not the Cleave Court uh, track ought to proceed. The point that was made earlier, and it's a quite a, an important point, that there are gaps in the track. And uh, in the motion, or alternative motion that's been outlined by Alderman uh, Edmonds, is that there is going to be, and it makes sense to have the gap filled. And I don't think there's any objection from the members in Cleve Court to have that track connected to Howrah and then obviously onto the foreshore uh, right down to Truthy Point. The point about this is that the Tranmere Coastal Reserve Activity Plan incorporated a lot of issues in relation to the foreshore plan. It covered a, a number of issues and because it's outdated in a sense that when community consultation occurred on Cleve Court, you had a whole new perspective in relation to what impact that particular part of the track would have on the residents in Cleve Court. Now, surely the petition and the people who have put forward their views have stated categorically there has been, um, they have not been consulted in particular in relation to Cleve Court and the recent changes that have occurred in the council's thinking in relation to part of the Tramia activity plan. So why doesn't why don't the, doesn't the council consider why the Cleve Court and that track should proceed or shouldn't proceed, given that there is a different uh, approach from the community residents in relation to it? There are gaps in the track, and I believe, and it's already been stated at uh, one of the presentations by a number of the um, uh, petitioners, that they are in support of the fact that there ought to be a continuation of the track from Howrah right through to Druthy Point. The other point I'd like to make, and that is that in the Tranmere Activity Coastal, uh, in the Tranmere Coastal Reserve Activity Plan, it did at that time stipulate and make provision or, or did indicate that there should be picnic tables and other seating and viewpoints in that particular area. But that was back on the 9th of the 3rd, 2018, when it was being considered, when it was being considered as part of the Tranmere Coastal uh, Reserve Activity Plan, and not just Cleve Court. So you really need to have another look at what the impact it has on Cleve Court, and therefore, if there's going to be a change in the activity plan for uh, 18 to 22, then you need to have a, a review of that because things have changed and circumstances have changed with it. I believe that the people in Cleve Court have, a, a, have reason to believe that they have not been consulted to the degree to which it impacts upon Cleve Court and also to they have the, the reasoning and I believe it's appropriate to support that the track should not proceed until such time as the gap is filled and that has been part and parcel not only of the activity plan 
the Tramia Coast Reserve Activity Plan with the Tracks and Trails, um, uh, uh, Tracks and Trails Action Plan of 15 to 20. I seek council support and I will be seconding Alderman Edmund's motion if this is lost. Other speakers? Alderman Warren. Um, thank you and I thank Alderman um, Edmund for his foreshadowing that motion. Um, I have yet to be convinced of the urgency of this. I, I think the, the track as a whole is, is certainly a um, worthy project. Um, but we're always looking for savings and other projects that are perhaps more urgent. Um, so I think until we have that, that link established, that I think it would be sensible to um, suspend this or postpone it and do something that perhaps the court needs a bit more direction and I think we can engage on those issues. So I won't be supporting this motion, but I would certainly support um, Alderman Edmonds' foreshadowed motion. Yes. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thanks everybody for their contribution. Now, I've often heard from the Tracks and Trials Committee that there are many tracks and trials that need some work here, and uh, which you know, I totally support. And uh, I've seen the representations and I've seen the, the petition against this track going ahead. So when I walked around it, I sort of shook my head and say, why? As many of them have said tonight, the track to nowhere, I'm not quite sure. You know, I walked along it and I said, surely there must be some other track that is more prioritised than this. I was surprised to see it was so high up. Uh, and I just walked it and I looked and I thought, why, why this track? I mean, I hate the little nooks and crannies and curves uh, of Cleve Court. I, I just think they're they're terrible, and I've got to admit that uh, you know I wouldn't like to live next door to those. That's for sure. But further down, where the track's established and it's got a good access to the to the footpath there, I reckon that's great. But here, I do agree with other people. If this kept going on the foreshore, I'd have no worries with it because when I read this report, and I thought I must be missing something. I must be missing something. I came in and saw the general manager this morning because I said, "What have I missed?" He said, "No." No, that's where the track finishes. And I thought, well, isn't this a bit ridiculous? Because I'm already told there's so many other tracks and trials where we could spend money. So look, I'm a bit like Alderman Edmonds. And this is my decision. It's not so much you know, the representations we've had and whatever. I just thought we could spend money in another place and really get something going straight away. Uh, Look, if this was continuous, I'd probably support it. But I really think that at the moment, I'll support Alderman Edwards' alternative motion if this motion is lost. Other speakers? Alderman Mulder. Yes. Um, when you look back at the, uh, the original issues here, there was one of, um, mainly it was uh, parking and the potential for antisocial activity. As a result of uh, several meetings and discussions, um, we decided that perhaps um, it needed to be a path to nowhere because the residents were particularly concerned about the track looping back through the, uh, the existing walkway in Fleet Court. So the reason it's a track to nowhere, quote, is because we were trying to deal with the concerns of the residents in that particular little, um, little alleyways, which I might say are terrible things and should never have been put in place anyway, but there they are and the people of uh, Cleve Court um, could ask to actually approach us if there was any problems there to actually close it or do something else with it. Anyway, that's the first, the, the first point is, is that um, it's not, a, it, it, um, it, it is, is the, um, it, the, the parking was the issue as well, which was with, um, and uh, I, I know, and I mean, one of the residents of Cleve Courts told me that um, there's nowhere to park there now let alone if there's an issue. And, uh, and one of the issues is it's a small court, it's narrow, uh, it's got a cul-de-sac at the end, but there's, uh, for example, I think there's, um, there's uh, well, residents have told me this, that uh, there's a, um, a student share house there, which has got five cars, four of which are on the street. So, you know, um, if you've got those sorts of issues already, um, then there are problems, and if you put no parking, it'll be uh, have to be residents exempted. So your no parking signs aren't going to achieve much anyway, whilst uh, because of that. So um, then there's this um, the idea of the road to nowhere, um, 
and uh, the, the track to nowhere, and that um, oh, it'll all be great, you know, if um, you know when the time comes. And this is a warning: the people of Cleve Court can take a little comfort from this being suspended pending the future track. The only point is, is that I'm going to say is that these people who are so keen on having this track, provided it goes somewhere, I look forward to a motion coming before this council to do the battery point thing and try to build a boardwalk around the foreshore because there is no public land above, below, above the high water mark in, in, the, uh, in the backs of uh, Corinth Street and Howard Point. So, um, you know, if, if, if we're so committed to this pathway, then I look forward to people coming forward with that particular thing and, uh, and, um, and wait to see um, how quickly they are to uh, jump on the, on the bandwagon and support the path above the concerns of the residents of Corinth Street. So it's not a road to nowhere, it's a road to a very uh, nice little spot where uh, things like family picnics could occur um, and where people can enjoy some of the things. Of the things. Now, if you look at our, where we have our barbecues and our picnic areas and things like that, they are always separate in, in different areas. If you go and have a look at uh, what we've done at Wentworth Park, um, they are discreet from each other. So the whole foreshore track at the moment is just a track which runs all the way along the foreshore, um, and there's um, and there's uh, there's constant uh, foot traffic through there. So people are reluctant to sort of do family picnics when there's a up a footpath down by. So here's a little good spot for retreat. Not all the kids like to uh, want to go to the beach and uh, some of them enjoy uh, swimming off the rocks and paddling in the rock pools and, uh, and there's even a potential for fishing there. So it's public space. It's a nice little spot uh, where it is at the moment. Um, and I really can't see, and I've, and I've been there and I've consulted with them and I've had people lobby me uh, pretty intensively because I don't live too far away and I tend to run into these people. Um, but um, the fact is, is that this will be an extension of a footpath. An extension of a path that is in our tracks and trail strategy. It's something that we've worked at. Um, it's been around a long time before I was here, uh, and it's been, um, and it's got to the point now. And I think from the original consultation on the original strategy, I think I was where we were first the other day, sort of some 1,100 letters that were sent out. We've got 123 responses, and only one objection to this particular section of the track. So that's broad community consultation. Since then we've been, we've had meetings with, uh, you know, some of us have uh, actually attended there, the officers had meetings with them, uh, the original um, two issues uh, were uh, expanded considerably in the petition. I think that that's all been looked at um, and, uh, uh, and all I can say is that um, I think it's either get on and do it now, if you vote for a suspension um, unless, um, you know, it's not a suspension, it, it'll, it won't come back and we'll never have that track and, uh, and we'll know that the public will uh, still feel that they can't use this area. Other speakers? Right of reply then, Alderman Von Bert oh sorry, Alderman Walker. Uh, just firstly through you Mr Mayor to uh, Mr Graham. The track proposed here is of a similar build consistency and width to the uh, existing track uh, that's further south to it? Uh, that is correct, Alderman Walker. Yep. Yeah. So, vision. Extension of the visually yeah. extension of the existing. That's right. So, it'll, 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 is it that track and the width of it, it comes that whole way down and we'll, we'll keep it that, that consistency and all that way through. And that is um, one of the outliers that's of concern for me because that is basically. Uh, if you like, intimating that it, it keeps on going and you keep on following it along. Uh, this area here brings me back to very much some of the concerns around the track that uh, the previous council fought so hard to get through along the foreshore in Ralph's Bay. That was basically a track that was going to go to an end point. Uh, it was going to create frustrations for users, and that was actually part of the plan. The actual plan, not written anywhere, but the vibe was create that frustration, and then there'll be a community expectation to keep extending it along. And boy, boy, was there some keen appetite in this chamber for a bit of eminent domain, a bit of compulsory acquisition of land. It's a power council has. Why the hell not use it? Why don't we grab some of that land and make a track? And that will probably be some of the attitude 
when this gets built because there is absolute water frontage part of tidal with these properties that are further north once this track finishes. Um, and I've got to say that as a philosophy, I believe in rule of law and I believe in property rights. Property rights underpins Western democracies. It's one of the key differences as to how there is so much more prosperity and freedom in the West compared to some of the tyrannical countries elsewhere. So where am I at this? Well, whatever happens in the next few minutes, the land that is public open space there will still be public open space. There. That won't change. It's an asset that any member of the community and people outside are able to enjoy. But I believe that keeping the track of such a, a, a high sort of usage and volume indicating that you go straight down there only to find that it, it, it finishes up isn't a good utilisation of council money. Perhaps if it was a more discreet little um, track like we're used to walking on in times past, that would be a different thing, but it isn't. So, again, on those, on those issues, uh, I'm not uncomfortable with what, with, with what Alderman Evans is proposing. I'd reply, Alderman Lomberto. So the motion before the Chair is that we note the petition, notes the GM's advice that it complies, authorises the GM to proceed and authorise the GM to re respond to petitioners. All those in favour? Against? Uh, motion's lost six all. Alderman Edmonds. I move the foreshadowed alternative. Alderman motion. James, second that. Do you wish to speak to it? Alderman James, any other speakers? Put the motion. Uh, um, I just want to touch on a couple of points that some people have raised there. Um, it's not a track to nowhere. It's an extension of the existing track that we're talking about here. And issues about, you can put a sign there saying, hey, 300 metres to go and it turns back. You can deal with that issue quite clearly and quite easily. Right, and the biggest issue here, guys, is not I was going to you before about when I went up there with my party, you know, 12 months ago. It is actually, we're allowing a small group of residents to dictate to us as a council whether people can use the space that's owned by community, you know. I mean, I agree with Alderman Walker in terms of property rights, but the community has a right to access the space, and we have a role and a responsibility to allow everyone to access all of the spaces that are under our control. And to stop a path going through because, you know, it's not, it's not going to nowhere, it can continue around the rocks. Everyone has a right to walk around the rocks and the, the examples that all of them are gave about some kids wanting to fish and some kids wanting to dive off the rocks and all that sort of thing. I spent a lot of time in that area when I was growing up and I mean, look, you know, we have a responsibility to create, people, to create that opportunity for people to do that sort of stuff. I'm extremely disappointed that the other aldermen don't uh, see it that way and I think it sets a terrible precedent for us as a council moving forward in relation to how we treat these sort of things and, and the number one recreational asset we've got in our, in our, in our city and we have a handful of people pull us up, I'm just very disappointed. Thanks all of you. Other speakers? Thank you Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, I'll be voting for Alderman Edmonds' motion because I don't want to see this go off the radar. I actually want us to have a robust discussion in relation to this because, quite frankly, I'm concerned that when we have a reserve activity plan with clear parameters as to what we're going to do that has been consulted on with the community in detail, the way that every other reserve activity plan has, that now we are, because we actually have had some members of the public who at, if you like, the 11th hour are actually following up with us, and yes, they have followed up with us, and yes, we have actually listened. The officers have listened, they've been out there on a number of occasions recently. We've listened, we've gone through this, we've had another workshop, I have grave concerns when we have strategic plans that then, for one reason or another, 
are being set aside. So I am going to vote for Alderman Edmund's motion because I want to actually have some more discussion about this. Thank you. Alderman Bromley. Mr Mayor, I move the motion be put. Uh, that's a procedural motion. Do we have a seconder for the procedural motion? Alderman Warren, thank you. So the uh, procedural motion is that the motion be put. All those in favour? Against? Motion is lost, six all. Uh, any other speakers? Alderman Walker? I don't think uh, speaking to motions is a joke, and I don't think it's going to take up a lot of time. So um, if we want to have some process where we all just decide what we're going to vote and then come here on the night and just go tick, 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 like some state councils do, well, someone can bring that up. I don't believe in that. I believe that actually debating around the table is good, um, and it brings into, into the mix concepts and things that people might not have thought through, might not have thought of, might not have uh, pre-considered. So, uh, I'm not liking this idea that if you tick off on a plan, you own every single bit of it, because uh, that seems to be the idea that, that's coming forward. Because each and every time an activity plan comes through a, a document um, in the community development space, each and every time there's things in those documents that I disagree with. Uh, sometimes to the point where I can't support the document, but usually uh, it's something that you wear when you adopt the document so that the general vibe and the, the majority of the, the uh, things that are put through go in. But if, if the new rule is, if you've ever supported a, uh, a plan of any sort that you're locked into each and every um, letter of line and bylaw, then I'll be uh, the temperance society. I'll be abstaining on all of them. So um, let's be reasonable. Let's be rational. It's public open space before the motion was lost. It'll be public open space when Alderman Edmonds' motion gets passed. It's a nice area, um, but, but having an industrial walking track going straight to a, a dead end, to me, didn't make sense. Uh, I'll be supporting this motion. Um, Mr Mayor, um, actually, I'll be supporting this because um, it actually keeps the dream alive. Had um, those who don't want to see this path go ahead uh, just left it at the, at the vote and not taken any more, then this path would be dead and all the representatives who are out there who didn't want this path to go ahead would be able to be less comfortable to know that this was not back on the agenda. What is on the agenda, of course, is, the, is, is, is overwhelming support for a path that links to Howrah Point. I look forward to those councillors who didn't want this part to go ahead for now to get behind us as we, go, as we uh, start to uh, gird, gird our loins to persuade the people of uh, Corinth Street and Harrow Point Court that it's, we are keen to build a, foot, a, a boardwalk around the coast below the high water mark um, so that there is no need for um, any of those sorts of things to do. So what I didn't hear in any of the representations and why I think um, this is uh, perhaps a, um, a, a fatuous motion is because what I didn't hear was overwhelming support to actually make it a track to somewhere. There were some suggestions that uh, when that happens, then we'll be happy to support it. Well, look out, I think this might come before us sooner rather than later um, and, uh, and so therefore I, uh, I thank uh, Alderman Edmonds for putting up a, uh, a motion to suspend rather than just defeat the track because um, the, uh, the people who have been busy lobbying us um, and have been so busy um, now need to, uh, to take stock and say that uh, this suspension <laughs> is not giving them what they actually want but is actually, uh, it's now still on the agenda uh, and maybe it should be sooner rather than later if we are to achieve our vision of being able to walk along the foreshore of the, of the Derby. Yeah, Alderman Evans, uh, before we uh, I call on right reply, and I'll call on Alderman's peers as well, uh, I want to deal from a matter from the Chair in terms of procedure here. Under Section 60 of the Local Government Act, we are required to deal with the petition. I would wonder whether you'd be happy uh, 
in oh. replacing item C on the officer's recommendation with your words so that we note the petition, note the general manager's advice and D, authorise the GM to write to the petitioners but that C becomes your alternative. Yep. If you're happy with that, uh, second to happy yes. with that? Yes. Okay, thank you. All of them uh, Thank you, Mayor. Look, uh, it's funny how the representatives are getting a, a lot of blame tonight, but as I said, the decision in the end was mine. And because I've heard so many times we've got so many tracks here that need funding, and I just can't understand why. If we're going to suspend this, why another track uh, we cannot fund and keep moving. Now I don't like this one, I've been, I walked it, I went through Cleve Court and I do understand what a tiny road that is. I think it's a good thing, it gives us a bit of breathing space on this. And surely the tracks and trails have got another track that would fill uh, the needs of people and can get started. So I really think that all this hype and you know sadness and all this thing, we're going to come back and you know you know, make the, make the rate payers so sad. I think it's a lot of rubbish. I think, you know, really, you've got to get on with things. And surely there's other tracks, which I'm told all the time, we need money for this track, we need money for that track. Surely another track can be picked out and worked on and leave this one alone. Your peers, other speakers? Uh, write a reply on the amended uh, recommendation with yes. item C change. Yeah, thank you very much for your your counsel there. Um, again, on this one, like I, I completely agree with the points that um, Alderman von Berto had about this has been a very robust discussion and that we have listened and then we each have to make a decision. And lo and behold, it's about 50-50 on this one. Like I think working together and with um, residents um, and tracks and trails, that there might be a way forward. And I guess that's the, the entire intent, intent, and I'm glad some people picked up on it about this alternative motion, was to suspend it and try and find a constructive way forward. Um, you know, comments like uh, Alderman Mulder's about, you know, the other parts of the track being required, yeah, that could be one way, but maybe it is also some of the stuff that was talked about with seating and things like that. But I think, you know, what's wrong with uh, listening to people and then making a, a decision like uh, Alderman Pearce has just referred to. So hopefully we can suspend this, work with the community, work with each other and come up with a, a way forward, whether that's next budget, budget after that, whatever. So thanks everyone for your time and the nature of the debate. Thank you. So the motion before the Chair is uh, as recommended in A, B and D uh, and C replaced by Alderman uh, Edmonds uh, Alternative motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Moving on to governance items. Item 11.7.1 Homelessness in Paris. Thanks, Alderman Bromley. Do a second, Alderman McKendy. Alderman Bromley. Uh, Your officer's recommendation, Mr. Mayor, in so doing, um, congratulate uh, Mr. Chiu and his team for the work they've done in this area. Uh, nothing really further to add to that. Um, just, it was about a year ago, I think, we'd raised this in council, and um, we'll just see that we're still discussing it, and it looks like something might be happening, and let's hope that happens before winter hits. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, perhaps my question, firstly, through you to Mr. Well, I was going to suggest Mr. Tui, but if it's the GM, then by all means, um, the the recommendation um, uh, states, amongst other things, and there's quite a few pages to this, receives the report, and I do congratulate the in-depth amount of information that's included in it and considers, uh, in Clarence, and considers acting on the recommendation as part of future budget allocations. Through you, Mr Mayor, um, the General Manager, or Mr Tui, just show me some uh, bottom line numbers in relation to this, or, or if there isn't any bottom line numbers, then Will we be considering those in the budget process? 
Uh, General Manager, will you, if I presume if we pass this tonight that there will be some calculations done? Uh, there will be a budget discussion, yes, and, uh, and costs will be quantified at that stage. Well, having said that, is there any areas in particular in relation to the, uh, the plan? And I've gone through it fairly quickly on pages three of four, uh, well, two of four to four of four. But it just seems as though certain places have been identified and contact people have been sort of flagged. But there just doesn't seem to be an area on which we can focus on as far as, as, as a monetary amount. I, it's going to, it seems to me, Mr. Mayor, there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done on this in order to flag an amount to be dropped into the budget. And also, it doesn't seem to have identified any specific areas other than those locations in which there are homeless people in Clarence. So are you able to provide some advice for that? Uh, for you, Mr Mayor, what, what, the, what the report indicates is that, yes, there are homeless people in Clarence. Yes, we haven't worked out what, the, what an appropriate response to that situation is. Um, before we can approach other, other organisations, whether they be Colony 47, City Mission or others, we have to have some more empirical evidence to support our case. Um, it's not, we're not, we don't, at this stage, we don't necessarily know what is the appropriate solutions for those 560-odd uh, people who may be homeless in Clarence. And what this report acknowledges is that before we can come back with a, a proper recommendation to Council, we have to do some more research into this matter. And when, in the, if Council supports this recommendation, what I'll be doing is I'll be working out in a bit more detail what how much it would take to undertake that further research to give council the confidence that what we were recommending has in fact a basis in fact for. I'll continue and um, in saying that, look, I think we need to do something about it and there has been some in-depth uh, research follow through with all these different organisations and so on and so forth from the attachments. And so, uh, I will be supporting it, but I, I do raise a, a question, and that is that we've got to go. In, we're going to go through a very tight or a timeline in relation to the workshops, the budget. And we've had a discussion of that last of a meeting before last Monday night. And at this point in time, we don't have any numbers. We don't have any specific goals or directions of where money is going to be spent, and. I really look forward to having something concrete, Mr Mayor, in relation to this, so that, you know, just to have a report and say we've done a report and then not flesh, have fleshed it out in relation to a monetary amount or areas where, in fact, this council can be pre proactive in being able to provide monetary and, and support. I, I just find that uh, it's lacking, but then again, look, being an optimist, I'm sure that Mr Tui, the general manager and their support staff will be able to come up with some numbers to provide to us during the uh, budget workshop and that we can actually say to the community and to the Greater Harbour area that Clarence has identified that particular location. It can provide some uh, support, whether in kind or technical or monetary, and then we can raise the flag and say, look, we are doing something positive in, in regard to homelessness. So, Mr Mayor, I really look forward to this um, and hopefully we will have some numbers, locations and something positive that we can flag to the other areas within the Greater Hobart area. Yes, I also um, you know, think that it's a great report and it's a good start and I congratulate all those who, um, who had uh, something to do with it. And, uh, and, and did the work um, with the note. I also share Alderman James's concern that um, if you look at the recommendations, um, it's uh, develop a strategic coordinated response, undertake community consultation, take immediate short term action on key issues, and none of those are building houses, and none of those are finding emergency accommodation 
or, um, or you know, or the emergency rooms that we talked that have been talked about. Strengthen networks and relationships at senior operational levels within council and stakeholders in the community, um, and that's it. I, I, I am struggling to find what the budgetary implications are at this stage, but we would be in a better position maybe after the next round of community consultations. Now that doesn't require, I wouldn't imagine, much of a budget to be considered in the budget allocations which are going to be in the next few months. So unless that consultation occurs and we find some positive things that we need to spend money on, I don't think we should be um, pushing that debate into the budget sessions. I think that debate belongs up here so that we can have a look at what those actions are in a public forum because this way you'll go around and we don't know what those, what those issues are. The public won't know what those issues are. We will go into the budget session and we will allocate money based on stuff that you know, hasn't been publicly discussed and debated. So, I, I think without undermining the work or, uh, or doing any of these things, but to make sure that when we walk through this we are publicly accountable, I'd like, um, if, the, uh, if the mover and the uh, secondary were, were, were to agree, to just put a full stop after the words Clarence and delete all the words afterwards. The council receives the report into homelessness in parks and thereby implying that there's more work to do before we start thinking about making budget allocations. Uh, and seconded. So, uh, the amended motion is uh, that council receives the report into homelessness in Clarence, and um, and uh, Stop. yep, that's it. Um, but uh, but speaking to that motion, just just in summing up, and, and I look forward and give every encouragement to the um, to the council staff to take both a city-wide <coughs> approach and to identify the stuff that we can do. And, um, and if, uh, if, if that was to come before council, um, then I'll be, uh, I think I'd be more than happy to, uh, to be supportive of, um, of, of discussing it in the budget process. Other speakers? Yeah, um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, look, I have to agree with uh, Alderman Mulder on that one there. I mean, I had some concerns with some of the uh, open-winded sort of uh, approach to this and I mean, I'm not sure any of us have had an opportunity to do anything we can to help uh, someone in a, a less fortunate situation we would, we would certainly do whatever we can um, and I mean I but the concerns I have we're, we're more you know we keep and from a more of a, a whole of council situation we keep throwing issues at our staff to deal with all the time you know, I mean, there's so many things that we've had in front of us even in the last couple of months like we, we've thrown another one at them to, to, to try and sort out and, and I'll raise this before about the duplication of what we do at state, federal and local level. We can't do everything. And, and I just have concerns about that issue or about wanting to be seen to be doing something but not necessarily doing anything that makes a difference. If all we're doing is talking to everyone and not doing anything for emergency shelters or, or you know, toilets and shower blocks that, are, that can cater for people unless they can have a shower and keep clean. Practical things all for some of the other stuff. I mean, all we end up doing, and I've seen this happen in a few other social justice sort of areas where it just creates an interest for more and more bureaucrats and staff to spend more time talking about it and nothing practical actually happening on the ground. So I would certainly be wanting to come back and look at this one in a little bit more detail um, and, and try and find a way about the practical things that we can do. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Mayor, I'm, well, I'm actually pleased uh, with the amended motion. That's a bit of rel relief for me. Now, at the moment, all we can do with homeless is guide them where to go, and that's all, you know, and I agree with all of them. Uh, you and tonight don't want to put our staff through, you know, much more. It's not their, not their responsibility, and if we can get homeless people to go to the right channels, that is a real bonus. One of the things that does concern me a little, and it's a bit early in the piece to be raised, to bring this in, but if we're going to give money, Clarence Road payers money for anything, Somewhere along the line, I think we need to know where these people are, are coming from. Are they actually in Clarence? Were they born in Tasmania? There's a few other things that I'd like to know before I just start giving out money because, I mean, there's all the organisations that uh, cope with a lot of this and, uh, and some people 
that I've tried to help that are homeless have sort of let themselves down, I believe, and I don't want to go into too much detail on that because they've had accommodation and, and uh, relinquished it for one reason or another. So here, all we can do at the moment is just give advice from people where to go. There are many places that they can go, but they probably don't, don't realise that. So that's something we need to actually get out there, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Mr. Mayor, I'd like to thank colleagues for the um, for their contributions this evening. I suppose if there's a um, there's a call for, for, for a number, the number that, uh, that that is evident to all of us is 562, and I think we'd all agree that that's 562 too many. And uh, it's good to see that the quality of this report. Um, I know that the seconder and myself, as well as it would seem the majority of colleagues. Uh, are frustrated that the wheels do move slowly. Um, they have, and they do move slowly. Uh, and obviously as we're going to the, the budget process now, there'll be a lot of competing priorities. Uh, and, and, I, and I thank the, uh, all the Mulder for the, um, the amendment to, to the recommendation, to now the amended motion before the Chair, um, uh, because this is an area that we do need, that will require resources to be under a problem. Uh, and we need to think that through, uh, obviously, very sensibly and responsibly and ensure that our response as a council is adequate uh, and strategic. Uh, the point also raised by Alderman uh, Ewington and uh, referred to by Alderman Piers, that ensuring our staff are appropriately resourced. That is going to be something that will face us uh, as we go into this budget process, Mr Mayor. We're all very well aware of that. And I am always um, in awe of the high level of service that is delivered by this council um, uh, with the level of staffing that we do. Uh, but I think it is inevitable as our population increases, as, as areas like this also increase, so will resourcing levels need to increase as well. Bless you. So that is uh, clearly something, Mr Mayor, that we need, that needs to be uppermost in our minds. But getting back to the particular amended motion, I thank colleagues uh, for the contributions this evening. Thank you. So the motion before the Chair is that we receive the report. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to Alderman question time, item 12. There are 12.1 and 12.2. There's no aspects there. 12.3, answers to questions without notice from the previous Council meeting are in the agenda. So propose we take those as read. Item 12.4, questions without notice, and I think it be your turn to start, Alderman Muller. My question relates to the, um, the properties that Council strategically acquired some years ago along Cambridge Road that, uh, that formed part of the um, development of Hunter, uh, the, um, the mooted 100 apartments. Um, in the, on the Kangaroo Bay Boulevard. Uh, the thing, my question relates is, have these properties been on sold to Hunter Developments? Not that I'm aware, no. 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 They have, okay. So um, they are, st being still owned by council, uh, does that then uh, put council in the position where um, owner's consent will be required for any developments on those titles. Um, I think the answer to that question comes in two parts. Um, if the land remains in council ownership, then yes, in the usual way. Uh, and if it is sold as part of any arrangement to do with that site and its development, then no. Otherwise, it will require consent. Okay, Alderman Kennedy. Thank you. Um, perhaps to the general manager, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, following on from Alderman von Bertock's question at our last meeting with regards to bushfire management strategy, are we comfortable with the level of hazard reduction that's currently happening as we move into what's usually the hottest month? There's been a lot of um, 
correspondence from various people within the city on this topic of late. I know we've got a workshop coming up in March, but I'd just like to know that we're comfortable with what's taking place. Um, thank you for the question, Alderman Kennedy. Um, in terms of hazard reduction, our um, major activities are carried out in cooler months. We don't carry out hazard reduction uh, during summer for obvious reasons. Uh, so at this point in time, we are at a state of pre you know, preparedness that we uh, achieved earlier in the year. It's probably fair to say there's always more that we can do, uh, but that's a question of resourcing and weather and, and a range of other factors at this point in time. So I guess this is part two of the question. With those people that are requesting for growth to be trimmed and um, some of the areas where there's a lot of bush building up uh, on council land around their properties, um, is that the response that we give to them? Uh, no, we would uh, we would take that as a as a works request and uh, investigate the appropriate way to deal with it and and whether it can be dealt with safe safely at that time. So. Um, it'll be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, not, not left to, uh, to wait unless there's no other choice. Um, well, it's a bit of an extension for uh, what Alderman uh, Kennedy's just asked, because I, I mean, I'm sure we all received an email from um, Mr Stevens up in um, Nancor Crescent. Um, and I mean, I understand your, your uh, point there, uh, uh, General Manager, about uh, reduction burns, but, you know, coming down of trees and clearing of uh, vegetation. And I sort of follow up for a question I asked a while ago from, um, have we got, or have we identified any areas at the moment that we are actually working on, or are we still just thinking about is, is there I'm any specific? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll, we've got an example here of a guy I mean, who sent an email to me um, uh, last week, but he, he corresponded with council on the 10th of January, and he hadn't heard back about what was potentially could be done for a large tree which was only five metres from his house that the fire service um, were concerned about that was going to potentially burst into flames and then set his house on fire. Uh, with, the way, with the way that he parked, I'd say. Uh, unless Mr. Uh, Graham knows uh, anything about it. Um, all, all of them you can send them through. I'll follow up on, those, on that one and, and see if there are any areas that we know of. And in regard to the tree itself, um, I take it that Alderman Newington wanted to answer in regard to that? Yeah, yeah, pretty right. I mean, yeah, but, um, yeah, I mean, these are urgent things for people who are asleep at night. Have, have we got that as a request in the system? Because I'm certainly not aware of it. Um, uh, it certainly has come through to me, uh, Mr Mayor, so I'll uh, make sure that our record team addresses it. Honourable Walker. Yes. Um, <coughs> presently, there is only one dedicated facility for dog walking in, or dog exercise in Clarence being South Street. Now, this reserve gets utilised during uh, bigger events at Blundstone Arena. My question is in relation to sort of the reserve management. It seems, uh, my understanding is that areas of it get, um, if you like, uh, bar, um, quarantined to sort of be re regenerated and this reduces access for, for dog utilisation and then you have the actual game days where a big section of the whole area gets used for cars. Is there any ability to, on those days when there's going to be um, the site being utilised for motor vehicles to, to, to actually use that area as well, um, potentially to let people use their dogs on the basis that it's probably not going to harm the regeneration if it's uh, an extra day here or there? Okay. Well, there's also there's also the aspect that it actually the car park doesn't necessarily fill up till quite till you know well into sometimes the game starting. So whether we can look at being more rational with with that space for the dog users users until the actual car park's close to full. Ah, <coughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so, so through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, our practice has been to open the entire car park to car parking for an hour and a half before the game starts because it is uncertain.
that up offline with uh, Mr. Graham. Uh, my second question is in relation to an event publicised on the Clarence Facebook page, which has now disappeared from me. But on the 2nd of March, I'll just dig it up, uh, it was advertised, I think, a sort of being well at work event. Just Nearly, the, no, no, nearly there, I promise. Oh. Now, here we go. Happy at work. The free forum for employees, workplace managers and HR staff on wellbeing at work. The free forum. Um, is this free forum an Orwellian term for ratepayer funded event? Uh, and if so, how much money are we putting into something that doesn't appear to be your core council business? I have to take that one on notice. Oh, Mr. Tui, are you able to throw some light on that? Through you, through you, Mr. Mayor, that was uh, identified as an action in a Cochran, General Cochran will be parish. Which goes to cost of building the staff home. Pardon me, uh, the cost I just didn't. Um, the only cost I can envisage is staff, staff time. Okay, Alderman Pierce. Thank you, Mayor. And Alderman James may be able to help me with this. A rate part family up about. Nalumi Street, Lindisfarne, that the street sweep is not going through there, and uh, because it's not going through there, it's blocking up the drains. I think you had the same request about a year ago, Alderman James. So if something could uh, be done there. Also, Mayor, walking round Cleve Court, and it's a very narrow footpath, I do know there's quite a few trees actually hanging over on the footpath. I wonder if we can just have a look at that, because I really think some of the <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I have, a, I have two questions. Um, the first one relates to an article published in the Mercury on 26th January. The Tasmanian government appears to be planning to duplicate existing wharf infrastructure at Bell Reef and Sullivan's Cove. According to the story, a government spokesperson is quoted as saying the planning had started for landside infrastructure at Bell Reef and Sullivan's Cove required to realise the commencement of a passenger ferry service. Mr. Mayor, given this infrastructure already exists, um, on behalf of ratepayers and also Tasmanian taxpayers, we all ought to be deeply concerned about the situation as it would... Uh, um, Mr. Mayor, what's the question? Yeah, I need the question, not the statement. Well, well the, the question is, and, uh, and this relates obviously to the statement, Mr. Mayor, can you, the General Manager, tell Council, uh, or answer these questions, please, have Council officers been engaged with the State Government in the process that I referenced in the statement? If so, what planning has been undertaken to date? And what is the anticipated time frame to deliver a passenger ferry service between Bell Road and Solomon's Cove? Is that three or two? That's the one question, three oh, parts. Okay, well. Uh, <laughs> General Manager, our <laughs> Try, I struggle beyond two questions. <laughs> two um, That's right. <laughs> um, where I understand the situation to be at is that the uh, ferry service was included as part of the city deal implementation plan and that's referenced in there and in the uh, 2019 current period um, that was uh, undergoing uh, investigation with a view that a business case would be developed in 2020-21 and beyond that we haven't had any further engagement with uh, DSG or any other part of the state government at this point. Another three questions, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a statement, though. Uh, it concerns the pedestrian safety issues in Lindisfarne Village. And uh, following our unanimous decision last year, I understand that traffic consultants have been undertaking, undertaking uh, concept design work for recommended options and have prepared a final report which has been presented to council staff. Uh, can you please provide an indication as to whether council's engineering team have had the opportunity to review the report and when all of them may expect to receive a briefing? on the recommended actions. Mr. Graham, do you have yeah. a report? Mr. Mayor, uh, we received a report on Friday. Um, it is 80 pages long. We're undertaking a review at the moment. We anticipate coming into Alderman's team on our findings this week to the Alderman in a February or early March workshop. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Edwards. First question. Uh, it's touched on, been mentioned a couple of times, but the audio visual protocols. I was wondering if uh, they could be provided to Alderman. Um, 
the but new audio visual protocols after the um, Rosny Hill meeting, if we could actually get our hands on what they are. Uh, the second one was uh, with the um, the uh, so-called sports rorts um, uh, th that's going on in Canberra. I know we did get a successful uh, application in in sorry in Clarence for uh, Risdon Vale, but I was wondering, is there, were there any other uh, applications made? No, I think the uh, Risdon Vale one was a state grant, wasn't it? Uh, first, I'll follow up. Yeah, I'll follow up on that one. Which one? Which one we actually got that through? Um, but apart from that, Pete. Yeah, I, I agree with um, Mr. Grahamstone. We'll need to just follow up and check. But the other issue with those grants is that we may not know what grants were applied for because they may have gone directly from clubs through to uh, through to the federal government. Yeah, but some were made by local government, I guess. That's oh, yeah, yeah, what I'm saying is that it's a much broader pool than just local government. Though. Yes, yes. yes. Alderman Von Berta. No. Alderman James. Yes, sir. Um, is the general manager or Mr Graham able to provide the timeline for the construction of the um, foreshore trail or pedestrian walkway slash cycleway from Bell Reef Beach Park, uh, which is basically being set out on dunes in that direction. Uh, through Mr Mayor, uh, we're aiming to tender those works out in March um, next month. Splendid. Uh, second question is in relation to the delay for certification by the Aboriginal Land Group for the survey on the um, fence at Anzac Park. Uh, is the General Manager able to provide any up-to-date information in relation to when the fence may be or will be constructed? Um, I mean, or directed. Can yes. I defer that to Mr Grant? Uh, through Mr Mayor, um, we're still waiting for word back from the Aboriginal Heritage Consultant on um, the assessment for that area. And then after that, uh, the EA will need to be submitted. In the meantime, we're looking at what appropriate um, signage should be installed by the I'd like to thank uh, Mr Chick for his earlier question, which leads nicely into mine. Um, could, through you, um, could I ask the General Manager for an undertaking that next time we have a meeting where there's expected to be significant public interest, that we have a technical expert on site, on standby for the meeting, because we have had a number of technical issues in a number of these meetings, and I really felt for our staff trying to sort out the problem without the necessary know-how. So just um, as perhaps part of your protocol to have a technical person on standby for such meetings. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I had a slightly different approach in mind. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow with the technical support people uh, to discuss a, uh, an ongoing service arrangement. Um, I don't know what that'll cost, um, so I need to, uh, to get those details and then bring that back to Council and uh, seek Council's advice as to uh, what, what expense and level of service they would be happy to accept. And my second question through you, um, Mr Mayor, also to the General Manager. General <coughs> Manager, were you aware that there was a near drowning experience at Lauderdale Beach this week? and that the ambulance was unable to access the beach uh, via the boat ramp? Uh, no, I was not. Thank you, Alderman Warren. That uh, brings us to the end of our open session. Thank you to the members of the public for joining us this evening.